Hi guys, it's Ollie from Rad Season. I'm stoked to be joined today by the uh, the general manager for North America and the global uh, chief uh, content officer for Fuel TV, Don Meek. Don, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Ollie. Good to good to be here. Good stuff. Uh, so, um, whereabouts are you at the moment, Don? Uh, Laguna Beach, California. That's where our U.S. headquarters are here. Right. And, and what's the situation been like over there? Uh, from a COVID standpoint? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, well, we are clearly struggling as a country and there mm -hmm. has been a lot of challenge. I mean, we're very fortunate here on the West Coast and certainly in Southern California where we're outside most of the time. And, and so we okay. don't I don't think we're staring down the gun barrel the way some of the folks in the colder parts of the country are. But it's mm -hmm. super challenging. And I'm I'm sure that, you know, we are a lot of us are in that same situation that, you know, many around the world find themselves in. It's un uncharted territory. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the good news is, but the good news is you can you can still go surfing. You can ride a mountain bike. You can go skateboarding. And so we're seeing that it is it's pretty uh, it's pretty incredible what what we're seeing in terms of that. So in our world, the uh, the participation levels are way up and and there's a lot of vibrancy in this. Yeah. And there's been there's been a massive uptake as well. Right. With with people either getting back into the sports or, you know, like like picking up their mountain bike again or. Um, you know, surfboards, you, you name it, trail running, people are kind of staying, staying local, but doing more outdoor things. Yeah. We're all locals again. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and so there's a lot more happening in that regard. Um, and some interesting data just came out, at least in the U S around uh, surfing participation and skate participation. I'm sure we're going to see the same thing in the winter sports where, there's just more people doing it because it's it's a safe, socially distanced thing to be able to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'd love to. Yeah, I guess take it back to where you got into action sports and you know what what started it all off for you. Well, it was really interesting. So I've been a surfer my whole life. It's really what I wanted to do when I was a kid, and I was lucky enough to grow up in Southern California uh, in the South Bay, and so I um, you know did all the things that you would do traveled and did all of that and then mm -hmm. when it came time to get a job i learned about the media business and i got into the uh into a position of selling television advertising and in 1990 i went to work for a company here called prime ticket network and we had um a lot of pro sports teams on local cable but we didn't have mm -hmm. any base baseball in the summertime so we had to figure out what we would do in the summertime and at the time we were carrying what was called the bud with the Bud Pro Tour and the ABP Pro Beach Volleyball Tour. And right. in 1991, we had a terrible advertising recession and we lost our budgets for producing those, those events. And so the guy that was running programming at the time, a dear friend of mine named Don Corsini, he and I had, be, had gone on a bunch of surf trips together. And he said, why don't you come and work for me? And if you can go find underwriters to help cover the cost of producing these events, we can keep them on television. And it was right then that he introduced me to the guys at Surfing Magazine, uh, Peter Townen and Bob McNone and Dave Gilovich mm -hmm. and Flame. And we put together the Beach Network where we were selling ads in the magazines, signs on the beach, you know, sponsorship on the beach, and then television ads in the tele telecasts themselves. And it just opened up a whole new world for me, um, which is what led then to uh, our team acquiring the Bud Tour uh, for television. Yep. We, we um, uh, I uh, created and ran for three years the US Open of Surfing um, and the American Pro Snowboard Series and a mountain bike tour called Downhill Mania. So we really, that was the beginning of it all for me in the early 90s of getting exposed to action sports as my profession but also as something that i loved yeah nice and was that i mean so were you guys then looking at the events and thinking okay how can we combine it with media or, or was it yeah. sort of like okay 
Yeah. So the guy, the guy that owned the Bud Tour at the time, well, Body Glove owned it. And um, Robbie Maestral, um, the son of one of the two founders, was running it. And he and I became good friends. And we sat down and we talked about the value of having an event on television versus not on television. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, there's, you, you can't compare the two. There's just the value of the sponsorship goes up, you, you know, exponentially when you've got it on on TV. Yeah. which then led us to think owning the events might be a better route forward um, because not only did it give us programming, we could get sponsors to help cover the cost. Mm -hmm. And we as a brand, as a television brand, got got great marketing out of it. And, and we could make money at it at the same time. And at the same time, ESPN had launched the X Games. So we were right there in that same time frame with them. So they had the X Games and we had our event group portfolio and, that's what started the whole thing. Yeah. Nice. And, and were you just focused on the, on the action sports event side of things then in, in the early nineties or, or were in my group, we started with action sports and by the time, well, you know, pro beach volleyball really wasn't an action sports, but it was a Southern California beach lifestyle yep. thing. Um, but we branched out. We had a rugby event or two that we brought over from the UK and, and okay. we had some other things within the, I mean, I'll, say we started, you know, we put the national inline skate series on television and at the time it kind of fit, but mm -hmm. inline skating didn't have the same. I mean, it was one of those things where we tried a bunch of stuff, but in the end, that was really the foundational part for what ultimately uh, CJ and those guys did at Blue Torch and then ultimately launching it into fuel. So the genesis was there in the early nineties for that. Yeah. Nice. And then where did you go? So, so, so after those early years, um, w w did you then go on to Sony um, fr fr from there or? Yes, yes. So um, I left Fox in 97, 96, 97, and I work, went to work for Sony Pictures um, okay. in, the inter in the international television group. And I had an opportunity to be part of a team that launched a portfolio of channels that Sony still own around the world, including AXN and Animax and Sony Entertainment Television. Um, yeah, so that's that was my first real foray into the international marketplace. Nice. And, and, and where was that? Was that in California as well? Or? Based in Southern California in Culver City at Sony Pictures headquarters. But that was the kind of job that kept you on the road 40 weeks a year, you know, okay. going into local market and being on the ground for three, four weeks and identifying, you know, recruiting and hiring and training local staff to run the channels. Yep. Yeah. Nice. And, and like, like what made you go into that? Like, like, like what was the transition? How come you thought, okay. Um, well, a good friend of mine was running international networks for Sony and he had a project that they had invested in, in the sports space. And because mm -hmm. I had a sports background and it was an event based property that they'd invested in, in London and he wanted to get some insight into how to optimize that. So it was a consulting gig that turned into a job. So they were, yeah. So it was one of those, one of those project-based things that turns into a, a meaningful opportunity. Yeah. Nice. And then, and then what was the, yeah, what was the journey from there? What, what happened? Oh, it's, it's, it's easy. So then, um, <laughs> then, then in 2000, um, I, so I, in 1995, I had a chance to, build the first website for the US Open of Surfing. I'd read a book called Being Digital by Nicholas Negroponte in 1994. And I bought 10 copies of it and gave it to my 10 closest friends and said, you guys got to read this. The world's going to change. And so partnered with Sun Microsystems and a web shop out of San Diego called Cyberworks. And we built a website for the US Open of Surfing. And mm -hmm. we did things that we never knew we could do. Um, like no one told us we couldn't do it. So we did it. And it's, it's funny. It's sort of where surf, it was Surfline's very first camera was oh, wow. part of that in, in 95. And so there was a lot of things that we had an opportunity to do. And um, so I decided to take a proper run through the internet space. So in 2000, 2001, I worked for iPhone, which was mm -hmm. uh, YouTube before YouTube, quite frankly. Yeah. And the uh, economics of distributing video on the internet were pretty, crazy um we had a hit movie that pretty much put us out of business because so many people were watching it and it just became that prohibitively expensive to distribute the content and there really wasn't video advertising on the internet at that point some brave brands had started doing it but mm -hmm. it was not 
generally acceptable at that point. People were just really wrapping their heads around digital display. Um, and then from, I, I went to the Gravity Games in 2003 and I ran that event as the president, which was owned in part by a company called Prime Media that owned the Action Sports Group of Magazine. So mm -hmm. we ran the Gravity Games and sold it. And then I went to work as president of the Action Sports Group. And that was a group that included surfer, surfing, snowboarder, skateboarder, and then the adventure titles were powder, bike, canoe and kayak and climbing. And we owned a half a dozen events and websites and we launched something called Wave Watch to compete with Surfline. So yeah, that was the Action Sports Group. And that went from 2003 to 2006. Okay. Um, and then um, went to Tribune Company, which was the big media company that owned newspapers and television stations and and had four jobs there in three years, uh, ultimately ended up as the chief digital officer. And then in 2011, it just became clear that the, the wheels were coming off and I had the opportunity to exit the company, which I did. And and then uh, started working on fuel and at the end of 2015. Nice. And yeah, now, I mean, how, how has fuel changed obviously since, since the, like the early days in, in, in 2003 when it began? To... Um, well, I, you know, it's interesting. I would say that fuel hasn't changed as much as the market has changed. Mm -hmm. You know, fuel's original vision of being the global home of action sports, which we defined as, well, well, I'll go back to the founding team of C.J. Oliveras and Scott Peridon and and um, the guys that really were Rich Batista and the guys that were really um, the ones at Fox that were the were doing the heavy lifting. Um, the vision was there's there are all these sports that people are participating in surfing, skateboarding, snowboarding, mountain biking, BMX, wakeboarding. And at the time, freestyle motocross was a pretty big deal. Mm -hmm. There was no legitimate home for those on television. And there was a large enough audience that was moving culture to believe that you could put it all together and package it effectively so that you became an authentic brand within the space to curate and present content that was authentic and resonated with the core participant base and really thinking about enthusiast sports differently than we think about spectator sports. So yeah. football in whatever form you want to call it, or basketball or baseball or gridiron or whatever it might be are spectator sports mm -hmm. um, that attract a wide variety of people and a very small percentage are within the active participant base, like tiny percentage. Whereas the enthusiast sports are what we described 30 years ago as vertical sports, are those that we ascribe the majority of viewer, <clears throat> viewership or readership to the active participant base. And so this would include all the aforementioned sports. And if you put them together the right way, then there's, there's an opportunity to become the channel of record for, a, for global lifestyle, lifestyle driven sports. Yeah. And, and um, so that's what fuel did. They did a great job. Um, and broke so much new ground. And in 2011, what's interesting, and not going into too much detail about it, but there was a there was an, uh, a deal that Fox did uh, back in 11 with UFC, and they didn't have a lot of places to put additional programming that they they needed to distribute. So they started using fuel for that. And I think that there was a waning belief that fuel, that action sports could scale much beyond the audience that it had already developed. Mm -hmm. And I and, it, and there was also some other things that were happening at Fox in terms of wanting to build a national sports strategy uh, to compete with ESPN. So fuel ended up changing its programming mix. It changed its brand. It had a bunch of different kinds of programs on it other than core action sports. And then in 2013, they uh, rebranded fuel TV to Fox sports Two. They took what was their auto racing channel speed channel, and they rebranded that Fox sports one. And so fuel went uh, essentially went off the air and went dark in the U S in 2013. But what's interesting about that is it never went off the air outside the US. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, it was still running in, in, in Europe in that time. and Europe, and, and that's exactly right. And so um, this was the, the, this is the great secret. If, you're, if, if you haven't been outside the US uh, in a while, 
to see fuel on the air, you never you never would have known that it had continued. So it went off the air, kind of gone and forgotten. But um, there was a team of people that kept running, kept it on the air based out of Lisbon, where you are just up the hill from you. Yep. And, and um, so that kept going. And in 2014, C.J. Oliveras and Fernando Figueroa, who's our now partner, um, my partner and our CEO, they actually uh, engineered a purchase of the fuel channel from Fox. Okay, nice. And kept it on the air outside the United States and then had uh, big plans and ambitions to bring the channel back here. But there were a number of headwinds to that. Um, there were financial headwinds and there were certainly marketplace headwinds where the cable business had started to really fragment or actually be challenged by the cord cutters where internet television was starting to become a real thing. So you had Netflix and you had a couple of other services that would give traditional cable subscribers the opportunity to cut the cord. Mm -hmm. But there was really not, not yet the what we call the OTT marketplace that there is today where channels can actually now be distributed without having to go through a cable operator or a broadcaster, where you can actually stand up a channel and launch it and get it onto virtually every screen in the world um, uh, using technology that's probably one-tenth the cost of what it was even five years ago. Yeah. And that's what changed everything for, for fuel. And so we are back in the US and back in Canada and just launched in Brazil. And so we have a, a whole new, we breathe a lot of new life into the channel. Yeah. Nice. And and when you when you came on board, I mean, so that, that, was, that, that was four years ago. What, what, what were you working on? Were, were you sort of looking at, okay, well, like, like what kind of content deals are we going to do? And like, like what, what was your kind of objective there? So I had joined forces with um, a guy by the name of Andy Schoen, who's one of the great American media executives, and he had been early days of MTV. Um, and then his most recent uh, thing that he had done is he had launched Revolt TV with, mm -hmm. Sean, with Sean Combs. And we joined forces in the end of 2015 to um, create a new company called Everyday Networks, with the theory being that a network services business with creative and technology and marketing and data and sales could be established to help set up new and we began calling them OTT channels, but ultimately they were all screen channels, where if you think about getting content to screens, is there a way that we could now start this next generation of channels where you had MTV back in the day, but now you have this whole new way of getting to the audience. And yeah. we, we were leaning into this idea of creating a, a unified technology platform and network services business to uh, build and distribute new uh, enthusiast channels and our, uh, our one of our partners suggested that we had a great theory and a great idea but perhaps we should uh, actually operate a business or two in the space to prove the theory and so that we could raise the money ultimately that we needed to raise to to get it done mm -hmm. so cj and i reconnected we sat down and we talked and we actually acquired fuel in july of 20 16 and we set about to integrate it into our organization and by the end of 2016 we had failed to raise the working capital that we needed to continue the venture and we ended up selling fuel back to fernando in lisbon mm -hmm. i stayed on the board through the course of 2017 and then i took an operating role in 2018 as chief content officer to figure out our programming and content strategy um, and then also find a way to bring fuel back to the U.S. Um, and that has been my 24-7 thing that I've been doing for the last two and a half years is figuring that out. And through a fortuitous set of developments, we were able to get it done. So not only do we have fuel on Samsung TV+, Plus, we've also got the, a bunch of conversations going on about getting it onto other platforms. Mm -hmm. And we also partnered with an amazing group out of San Diego called Opera Sports to launch Fuel TV Plus, which is our subscription video on demand app, currently available only in the US and Canada. But it's our entire fuel library going all the way back to the beginning, plus our 24 7 channel, um, all commercial free. So that's Fuel TV Plus. Awesome. 
And I mean, how has the, with the media landscape changed over that time? And it's, it's moving so quickly, right? I mean, mm. those, the, the, those last couple of years, how, how has that, you know, you know, what sort of challenges have you seen there? Oh, I would say no. I, I don't think challenges. I think nothing but opportunity, actually, for some for a channel like ours. Yeah. Um, yeah. It. So I think it's happening on multiple fronts, but it's all leading in a single direction, which is how is content going to be distributed and consumed over the next however long it's going to be, mm-hmm. and the old the old monolithic cable bundle is imploding right in front of our eyes. So when you take a look at how the traditional means of distribution, where you had a studio or or a network acquiring or creating content and then distributing that first over the air and broadcast, and then cable comes in to, uh, in, into existence. And now not only is cable used to distribute a broadcast signal to a distant market, you've also now got the ability to create cable only channels or satellite only channels yeah. like a direct TV or a sky in the UK or a Foxtel down in Australia. And you, you, you had these geographic monopolies where these cable operators owned a territory. And the only way you could get your television was to subscribe to a bundle from them. And, and that was the status quo up until what, five years ago, six years mm-hmm. ago. Um, and then all of a sudden, bandwidth becomes more affordable and faster and more readily available. You have entrepreneurs who are creating new technologies to be able to do things around video compression where you can actually get something there much more efficiently. And you've also now got device manufacturers that have figured out that there's a bunch of channels out there that will never get launched on cable, but you could put them in an app and you could get them out to every screen in the world. So all of these things are happening at the same time. And then the device manufacturers decided figured out. So the Samsungs and the LGs and the Vizios of the world realized that, yeah, there might be an Apple TV that you could connect to your television set to be able to get apps, or there was an Amazon Fire TV or a Roku box. Um, That technology, there was nothing terribly complicated about it. And Samsung and all these guys start to build those capabilities directly into the sets themselves. Yeah. With app stores native to Samsung or app stores native to Vizio, and then they, I don't want to say stumbled on, I think they got there pretty mindfully, but they realized that there's a whole bunch of content providers out there like us that are never going to get back on cable because there's it's in, it's an extraordinarily expensive thing to do to get your channel onto a cable system. You don't have any, there's they're never going to pay a subscription fee again. That's just not going to happen. And to sell your advertising, is really difficult when you're a small channel like Fuel to to build and maintain a direct sales team that's going to be able to monetize that inventory that you might get at Mm. any meaningful scale is virtually impossible to do. It's just, it's not going to happen. So now all of a sudden, what was happening in digital display advertising with the growth of the supply side platforms and the demand side platforms in digital display now starts to migrate its way into television into what we would think of as broadcast TV or cable TV. But now with digital television, now you can connect the machines and you can actually create the signal to be del- from us to be able to be delivered to what we consider destinations or endpoints, call it a Samsung TV plus or a Rakuten or whatever it might be. We now can deliver the same signal with ad spots available in it and now through programmatic advertising, you can monetize your inventory, which two years ago wasn't possible. And, yeah. and, and today it is. And so it means that with some nuance and there's a whole bunch of moving parts that you have to consider, still we can launch TV in the United States. So fuel on Samsung TV plus in the United States is on channel 1179 on TV plus, and you can turn it on right now and you'll sit down and watch a linear viewing experience with ads and the breaks that the ads are supposed to be in and it's completely free to you you don't pay for it you don't have to pay for tv plus it's a completely free experience and so i think this for us was the real game changer while we have an app and you can subscribe to it and you'll get a different viewing experience 
still the idea of sit, sitting down and watching the global home of action sports on your Samsung TV anytime you want for free is a really compelling value proposition. And so that's how the market changed. Um, and so for me personally, as somebody that sold a bunch of ads back in the day to be able to sit down and watch our channel and see an ad run and realize that I actually didn't do anything to make that ad run. There's other people doing it and the machines are doing it. It's a, it's a pretty crazy experience. That's cool. And uh, what are you guys working on now? So, I mean, are there any kind of like, like major projects coming up for next year? Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we were able to do a deal with the WSL for uh, their rights outside the United States. So it's about 400 mm -hmm. hours of live television that we will have from them. Um, we're talking to a number of other of the um, Olympic qualifying guys to determine what we might be able to get on the air uh, as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have been producing content consistently out of Lisbon over the last five years. So we've got some new programming that people have never seen before in the territories that we're launching in. Um, and then we've got some franchises that were incredibly popular uh, back in the day that we're resurrecting. One of them is Built to Shred. We're mm -hmm. very excited about that one. Another one is Drive Through, where we're looking at doing a next, the next generation of Drive Through. Um, we're looking at China right now as potentially a territory to be able to go do some surf exploration. Oh, cool. uh, we've got some conversations going on in the skate world, uh, in various places. Uh, had a fantastic conversation with the guys uh, from the Jackalope Festival up in Canada on mm -hmm. Saturday about potentially working with them. Really excited about that. So we've got, yes, a, a tremendous number of things that we're doing. Um, and then we want to follow up, too, on what the initiative was that we undertook in April called United Action Sports, where when the pandemic hit, it became pretty clear that a lot of our core brands were going to suffer like everyone was. And, and the one thing we could do is we could mobilize some of our global advertising inventory because there's not a global market for ads, really, at the end of the day. There's local and regional markets for ads. And so we mm -hmm. have inventory available to be uh to be utilized. And so we donated about half of our inventory to qualified action sports brands. And the proposition was simple, send us your spot and we'll run it. And we ended up over a 90 day period um, mobilizing about $11.5 million worth of advertising value. We transacted with about 100 brands, ran about 70,000 spots, and it opened up conversations with really progressive brands about how their content can also be part of the fuel TV lineup, which makes sense because they're making beautiful content with amazing yeah. athletes. And YouTube is one place to put it, but it's not a great, it's not the greatest user experience in the world. And so if we can be the curatorial platform and really lend the authenticity to the environment in which something is being viewed, we think there's a significant amount of value in that. So working with brands has been another big part of it. Brilliant. Nice, and um, I mean, ob um, obviously, with the w with the Olympics that was going to be coming up this year, going into next year. I mean, ha has that been just has that had a massive effect with those action sports that are going to be included in it? Um, would you say? I don't, you guys? I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Well, look, it's clearly had an impact on events. So, mm -hmm. where part of our Part of our programming has always been event coverage at, at, to some degree. It's had a it's had a massive impact on events. I none of us know what's going to happen um, in terms of the. It, will there be an Olympics? Don't know. I mean, it's it's still too soon to tell. But I think that competition in these sports represents a very small segment of what's important. I think it's, I think that you could, you can make the argument and I certainly have over the years, having put a lot of surfing on television, that it's inarguable that the best surfers in the world are on the pro tour. They are. I, that, at for them, I, I would say for the most part, that's true. There are some great surfers that are not on the pro tour, but that's where progression is happening. It's where you see the highest level of performance. I would say the same thing is probably true with street league. I would say the same thing is probably true in the Olympic snowboarding movement, mm -hmm. but competition only represents, like I said, a very small sliver of people's interest and attention. Yeah. 
And I think that there's a lot more out there in terms of interesting people going interesting places and doing interesting things in this world that we're part of that I think makes up a much bigger opportunity for a, for a, for a brand like ours, where we can, we can tell all of the stories and we're not just constrained to telling stories about competitions and yeah. who's number one and who's number two. The other thing I'll say is that, that you just can't refute the data. More people are surfing and skating and riding mountain bikes today than have ever been doing it in the history of these sports. And while five of our core sports since we started are now in the Olympics, the only one that was there before was snowboarding. And now you've got mm. BMX and skate and surf. You've now had a legitimization of these sports as, and you can talk about the Olympic movement, exploiting skateboarding to go younger. And I think there's some argument to be made for that. And does that really reflect the true spirit and nature of skateboarding? Again, it's, there's two sides to that conversation. Yeah. But sometimes it's not telling the story about the Olympic number one. Sometimes it's telling the story about the kid who's making a difference in their neighborhood. And I think this is where fuel really shines, where we can tell the stories in a very authentic way. And in a, in a lot of ways, we're hoping to be able to turn the channel over to the people who are actually making it happen because mm -hmm. um, we're not constrained by a lot of the old um, the old structures and strictures of, of broadcast television. We can be a lot more creative and we also don't have corporate lords and masters that we have to report to. We can, I, I don't mean to say this in any way, but just we're so lucky to be able to do anything we want is, and, and try things out um, with a lot less interference than maybe before. That's cool. And what's what's the best way for um, for for people to yeah to to follow fuel or you know to subscribe? Oh yeah, well if if you have a Samsung television and that's uh, from 2017 and later, you can find us on TV Plus if you live in the U.S. or Canada or in soon to be Australia, Brazil, Mexico, and India. Um, you can find fuel. Um, if you live in the U.S. or Canada, you can subscribe to Fuel TV Plus. Plus. Fuel. TV is the way you get there. You can follow us on Instagram at Fuel. TV and at YouTube we're Fuel TV. So we've got uh, we've got a a presence that's growing on social, and so that's a that's the way that you can follow us. Yeah, perfect. And if, if people want to get in contact with you, Don? Oh, it's easy. Don at Fuel. TV. Yeah, I'd be happy to and, and would love to talk to any of the storytellers that are out there, any of the people that are creating content, thinking about content, um, wanting to get more information about, you know, what's possible to, to be done. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're really excited. We want to find this, the, this next generation of storytellers. That's one of the things that we think is really important. Um, you know, there's a whole new group of kids who are getting off their phones and they're getting outside and they're doing things and they're skating and they're surfing and they're riding their BMX and they're, and they're playing baseball and they're having fun and they're doing a bunch of different things. We want to meet those guys and girls. Um, that's really what we're about is really figuring out um, who the next ones are. Yeah. And, th and then telling their story and all the different that lifestyles that come with it. Right. And letting them tell their story. We're yeah. talking about developing a show right now, um, called Freeman and Fish, where it it's about this group of kids down in North County, San Diego, and they'll check the waves, and if the waves are good, they'll go surfing, and if they're not, they'll go fishing, and if they're not going fishing, they're going to ride their skateboards, and then they're making their own fishing poles, and they're going diving, and they're it's just an amazing group of kids who are living this lifestyle that's really incredibly attractive, but it's super authentic to who they are. And yeah. they also play video games, but that's not all they do, you know? So it's this, it's, there's this new ethos that's, that's bubbling up and we're really excited to tell those stories. That's cool. Good stuff. Well, um, yes, yeah, it's, it's been really good speaking to you and finding out more about Fuel TV and yeah, look forward to seeing what happens uh, with all these future projects. Uh, well, thanks a lot. Oh, yeah, I really appreciate it. And, and make sure that in Lisbon, you know, we're fully distributed and you can watch us and you'll, you'll improve your Portuguese. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Good. Good. Cheers. Thanks. See ya.